All right. So now we go into what happened in the last few years, and Google changed the world. Google changed the world by publishing three papers, and the first paper was Google File System. The reference is at the bottom. This paper basically said how to store big data means how to store lots of data and you know google has been storing the biggest amount of data right but unlike other companies that were doing it before where they have big disk and you know big tapes and things like that what they did was they just put some cheap pcs and put some disk on it so this was all distributed because they're cheap they will go down very fast rather than having real high quality arrays like companies do. They had just cheap PCs with cheap disk in it. And so, so that was the thing. Google file system basically said we are, going, we are going to use cheap parts and therefore things are going to break but we will keep three copies. So let them break, we will be able to make the copy if one thing breaks. So they, so what they did was they have these lots of computers, we call them chunk servers and each thing that you want to store is broken into chunks and some chunks are here, some chunks are there, some chunks are there, some chunks are there but there are three copies of each chunk. <coughs> if something breaks down then a copy wherever it exists is replicated. So B4 break down, so we take B4 from here make a copy. And and if something is written, then we write it to all other copies as well. So if somebody is writes here, then it is written to other places. <coughs> all that is good. And there is one master server though. In addition to this chunk server, there is a master server which is a central controller, which really keeps track of the whole thing. So this knows where B1 is. B1 is here, B1 is here, and B1 is here. Right, you will lose the bamming. But what you do is then you keep two master servers. <coughs> So basically there must be a standby server, but for the time being, let's assume that there is one master server and it keeps the whole map. When somebody comes to write, they don't go to the chunk server, they go to the master server, say I want to write block B2, right? And master server says, okay, go to chunk server 3 and then it writes B2 and then chunk server 3 also writes to other places. RAID. Yeah, right. So there is, there is very similar. It's just that instead of taking a RAID they made a big raid. <laughs> this is big data. <laughs> right? So it's a very large scale. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, this is just a replication. Right? And um, this is a distributed replication. So, for example, um, these two copies are in this rack, and this copy might be in over there, some other place. <laughs> Physically, also in separated. So yes, the concepts were there, RAID were there, and, and this is, yeah. Chunks are addressable. Chunks is what you get. So basically, um, in the database things, you really don't go for, you know, little pieces. You just, you want, you want to work on, you know, two petabytes. You're not going to ask for, you know, byte at a time. You say, okay, give me 64 megabyte. That's a chunk. <laughs> big. Six, I, I think it's 64 kilobytes something. But anyway, so whatever size it is, a big amount of data that you take once and then you work on it and then you get another chunk. Chunks are addre addressable. If your question is chunks are addressable, yes. Addressable. It makes yeah. a difference from bit addressable, byte addressable kind of. Yeah, yeah, right, right. They, they don't deal with bits and bytes. All right. So this is Google file system. And they basically using that, they, they, they made a distributed storage system which they call Big Table. And uh, Big Table was also published, and all of these papers are available on the Google website, by the way. <coughs> and so what they do is they store the data in the rows and columns and so on and so forth. The main thing about this one is Big Table actually is not very critical, but I just wanted to put it here to be in the correct sequence <laughs> because this is all proprietary. Big Table is not available for anybody else to use. Okay? And uh, since nobody else uses it, you know, I just uh, I put some minimal information here. So the key thing about this data is that while if you have lots of um, rows, most of the rows might not have a lot of information because they might be empty. Okay, so sparse data. 
So this is designed for that. It is optimized for sparse. Sparse means mostly empty. And then they again use commodity servers and this is not used outside of Google but accessible by Google App Engine. So Google has this API which they have published. If you use that API, you can use that table. So first we saw a file system, then we saw a database system in some sense. Then they have a methodology called MapReduce. Again, this is another Google paper. And MapReduce said, how do you really analyze big amount of data? If you have 16 petabyte and you want to do it in few seconds, how do you do it? Right? So you put 16,000 workers on it. That's the whole trick. Is that you put a lot of people to work on this data in parallel. So you divide the problem into many, many pieces. And then you let everybody work. And then when they are done, you combine the results. That's all there is. Map and reduce. Map is distribute, reduce is combine. So distributed over a large number of inexpensive processors and everywhere their concern was that they really didn't want to buy very powerful. See, previous to this, people used to buy really big IBM systems to do a database analysis. And these guys said, we don't want to buy any IBM system, we want to buy Dell computers or something like that. I don't think they buy Dell, but some cheap PCs. And so that is what it is, is that distributed over a large number of inexpensive processor is scalable and the number of processor obviously is, is a big problem, you give more, less problem, 4, 5, 10, 40, 400, 4000, doesn't matter. So that is variable. Fault tolerant. And again, just like the disk, if you give it to 4000, some will go down. These are cheap PCs. Right? So you ask two workers to do the same thing. If one goes down, the other one will bring the result. If both of them go down, then you ask third one to do later on. And so on. So that is what it is, is that basically redundancy is there. So map is to take a set of data and convert into another set of key value pairs. So basically, <coughs> most of the data is organized like XML. I don't know how many people have seen XML. In XML, you have keys and the values, keys and the values, keys and the values. Right? So the database is organized like a key value pair and you just take some keys, you say, well, all right, everybody whose last name begins with um, Jones, you analyze it, everybody whose last name begins with Smith, you analyze it and so on and so forth, this key value pair, right? So, so basically, um, so the map divides it and then gives it out to lots of people and then the reduce takes the output and produces the output. Obviously, there is redundancy everywhere and so there are lots of mappers and when the result is done, there are few reducers, reducers two shown here. They reduce it and then you get the output. Key, key value pair. So, I mean, actually a slide is coming later on where I showed some values of the keys and pairs. But basically, here is the thing. Let's say, let's take your address book. <coughs> In the address book, you have record number one, um, some is Mr. Smith, age, so much, gender, male, you know, income $10,000, $100,000, something like that, right? So you could just write that as that the income colon 10000 so that is the key and that is the value. And that's a pair. <laughs> and then gender colon male. That's a value pair, right? I mean, I, then I could just take and tell him that, okay, analyze all the people whose gender is male. You analyze all the people whose gender is female. It's key value pair. Then, you know, you can divide the database by any key values. All right. So here's an example, actually. Uh, what you asked is just coming up. 100 files with a daily temperature in two cities. Each file has 10,000 entries. So this is big data now because we took the temperature every second or so <laughs> and two cities. So for example, one file may have Toronto 20 and New York 30. That's the temperature. This is the city name. This is the temperature and on and on and on and on. And on. So the two sensors are sending us the temperature data and we are just putting it in the file. 
So these are the key value pairs. Our goal is to compute the maximum temperature in the two cities. Assign the task to 100 MAP processors. Each works on one file because there are 100 files. Each processor outputs a list of key value pairs. So this one goes and then comes out with, you know, all these 10,000 entries, it comes out with two values. It says, well, in this file, the maximum Toronto was so much, maximum New York was so much. Then the other guy is always, and their file, they see, okay, maximum Toronto was so much, maximum New York was so much. And so on and so forth. 100 people can do this in parallel. And then what we do? We take those 100 numbers and find out the maximum of those. That is the reduction process. Right? So, alright. So, each of them outputs a list of key value pairs. For example, the first one could say Toronto 30, New York 65. Now, we have 100 key value pairs now. Right? At 200 in this case. With 100 ma mappers, right? We give this to two reviewers. One for Toronto and another for New York. Toronto one will take the Toronto one and come up with Toronto 55. And the New York one will come up with 65. So, that's your final result of going through so much work. Aggregation, but in this case, aggregation was also paralyzed because, because the result was, you know, paralyzable. You know, here we needed two cities, so we had two people working on it. Some cases, when only one result you can have. Say, for example, if it was all one city, then we'll have to, you know, basically, I mean, you could do in two steps of mapping, but I think you basically, you know, you just do it and then one reducer will reduce it to one number. In this case, there are two cities, so that's why we have two reducers. So, map reduce optimization. So, we were in the middle of map reduce, and um, we know that we break a job into multiple tasks. Okay, uh, and the tasks are scheduled before the reduce task. So, basically, we had hundred files in our previous example. Right, but if you don't have 100 processors, you can do it on 10 processors, but you will have 10 map cycles. So, the number of processors does not have to be equal to the number of map jobs. The map jobs actually in both cases are decided by locality of the data, wherever the data is, that's where you have to generally schedule the job, but uh, you could do it in many cycles. And, um, and then the reduced jobs are also done in parallel. Now, it doesn't, it is not necessary that you finish all the map jobs before you start reducing. All right. And so, people who are doing research in this area, they are basically saying what is the right way to schedule all these things. Okay. So, that is not, I mean, that is basically, that is where the expertise lies. That's where the different uh, companies or different people will solve the problem differently because they will have a different number of map reduce and when they start how they schedule them so all that is optimization all right synchronization the map jobs should be comparable so that they finish together now it is not necessary but if you have one job which finishes after 100 units and everything else has one unit, then 99 units, somebody is waiting for nothing. Right? Either the map jobs cannot be assigned, new map jobs cannot be assigned, or reduction cannot be completed. So, you really need to divide. So, when you do key value pair, and you have to say, well, you handle these two keys, keys you handle these two keys, or you handle these 20 keys, you should divide it somewhat so that they are approximately same number, same amount of time. All right, so you should have some idea of how much, how big the job is, and that is how you should do it. And code and data collocation, we already talked about that, that you should put the map jobs, now one of you can go and get the handout, <coughs> map jobs, and um, where the data is. So, one thing is then the Google file system. The difference between the Google file system are actually in this case HDFS as we will call it in a minute, Hadoop file system is that the data is not over there. The data is right here with the processors, local disks. 
remember when we talked about data centers we talked about storage area networks so there was a place where everything is storage and then you have fabric fiber channel coming in to your processor server well that is that was then now basically it's better to keep that data you are processing right local right so there are local disk and so the jobs that are assigned are they are assigned accordingly either you have to move the data which you could do either you move the data or you assign the jobs to the where the data is so each of these map modules or reduce they are basically servers with storage they are virtual servers with storage they are servers but they could be virtual virtual servers yeah they could be virtual but the storage is local right <coughs> and fault and error handling if a processor fails basically you will know why time out or things like that or you know no hellos then the task needs to be assigned to another processor so that is in a clear is that um, you generally assign to more processors than you know you have jobs and some jobs you know i mean if so that way if you if you really want to do it you know make sure that you don't have to wait longer then you can already assign two, two processors to each job and both of them are doing the same thing or three processors to the each job and all three are doing the same thing but as long as soon as one completes we are done so so there is lot of performance optimization which is required here distributed hash tables work very differently i mean i wouldn't go that here because you know that is I mean, you know it, but everybody doesn't know it. So I'm not going to explain that right now. So it's not like that. In the distributed hash table, there is no master in the first place. Here, it is centralized. So there is no need for P2P communication, peer-to-peer -peer communication. The slaves, I mean, in this case, we call them. The names are coming up in the next slide, I think, or maybe they were in the previous slide. Names are coming up in the next slide. Um, so they are task nodes. They don't talk to each other. generally i mean they don't need to talk to each other they just need to follow the master okay so let's say let's go back to our previous example the question is what happens if the processor fails so you have 100 files and you have 100 processors if a processor fails you will not get you will get 99 results and one you will not get right so you will reassign it to somebody else or you could have just divided the 100 files into 50 files and 50 pairs and you give two files to each of the Hundred processors. Understand what I am saying? You give two files to each of the hundred processors. So you have now created two hundred jobs, even though there are only hundred jobs, right? So there is one level of redundancy right there. If one processor fails, somebody else is doing the same thing. No problem. Well, these are not okay. So generally, in the data centers, are in the old data centers, people used to buy special Xenon. processors right not processor that you and i use at home <laughs> right so they are expensive but these are not the expensive processors these are cheap processors cheapest one that anybody makes and so they can fail same thing by the disk these are not really you know high fi disk these are cheapest disk okay so your question is it is is it possible that some processor is so slow so that will not be called as failed Okay, if the processor is slow, then the master will know that this processor is slow, and let me give him half the job. See what I mean? So that part is understood. The part is not predictable is is failure, something unexpected. This can fail, job will not be finished. Okay, so we are done with the optimization.